guys. Good evening. It's good to be with you guys tonight um, here at Calvary Chapel, Knoxville. It's always good to come back. Um, open your Bibles tonight to Romans chapter 8. We're going to be looking at just one verse tonight. Um, Romans chapter, we have actually as a church, Calvary Chapel, Smoky Mountains, we have been going through the book of Romans. Goodness, I think this, this might, by the time we come here, might maybe the 38th message in the book of Romans. So we're not in a hurry. And we've been doing this incredible journey. And, and in it so far, it's just been encouraging. It's been challenging as we have read the words of Paul. So by the time we as a church have come to Romans chapter 8, we are excited to be here. We're excited. So we're just going to kind of camp out on this one verse tonight. Um, so we have read all the way from chapter 1-1 one, one, all the way up to uh, chapter 8. We have read the words of Paul to those in Rome and, and really to us today. Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, has challenged the religious leaders of the day. And then in Romans chapter 3, he's actually challenged the super religious, the ones that, well, they, they looked at themselves as, as they were the ones that were good. They were the ones that were doing really good. Nobody else was, but, but they were. And so Paul's challenged them. He's challenged the heathen, the one that, that doesn't know the Lord. And he's also challenged those that, that have a relationship with Jesus, but, but still struggle with things. And in that last part of, of Romans chapter 7, we see that, that even the Apostle Paul struggled. Even the Apostle Paul struggled with his flesh. See, when we think of Paul or we think of any other great person of God, maybe, you know, how Billy Graham was or even Pastor Chuck Smith, some great just men of God in, that you know, we have a tendency to think that, well, surely they have no problems, like they maybe float above the ground just about six inches, right? Like there's no problems at home. There's no problems at, in anywhere. That's the tendency that we think that everything in their life is just perfect. But, but that's not the case at all. They have struggles. And, and they wrestle with the same enemies that we wrestle with. The flesh, the world, and the devil. And one of the struggles that so many Christians have is that of condemning themselves. It seems like so many Christians today are living in defeat. They're not standing in victory because, well, because they've been beat down. So what I want to do is I want to spend the evening looking at this one verse because I believe it's so important for us to realize that we, if you're in Christ, we're condemned no more. Let's look at verse 1. Of chapter 8, and we're going to repeat this verse, so by the time we leave, I'm hoping you'll have this verse memorized. It says in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. See, if we are in Christ, we, well, we're a new creation. That we have passed from darkness to light. That we once were blind, but now we see so I think it's important to really grasp this and to hold on to this and really to live that way. To be freed from, from this condemnation. To be freed from this guilt. And to truly live in the freedom that is yours through Jesus Christ. Now that word condemnation, if you just, just, just think about that word condemnation, it doesn't even sound good, does it? It doesn't even sound good. It sounds so heavy. It sounds so burdensome to be condemned, to, to be under condemnation. And when we think of condemnation, we think of things like, in the real world, things like, well, houses are condemned. Houses get condemned. And, conde and a condemned house is not going to last very long. Why? Because if it's condemned, it will soon be torn down and replaced. We think of criminals. Well, they're condemned too. It's a life sentence or a death penalty sentence because of, of their crimes. It's a heavy word. For those that are taking note, Notes the word condemned in the original language literally means a decision against someone. That there's been a decision made against you or a judgment made against you. Webster's Dictionary defines condemnation as to declare reprehensible, to declare wrong or, or evil, to judge, to, to pronounce guilty, condemnation. I mean, do you ever feel condemned as a Christian? Like, I got both my hands up here, right? 
it's silly to even ask the question, isn't it? See, we've all faced it one time or another, condemnation. Sometimes other people try and condemn us. Other times we bring it upon ourselves, but condemnation, well, it's just a reality. It's so much a reality that God reserves a time in his scriptures to say and to remind and to teach that there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. I mean, do you ever feel like there was a decision that was made against you? A a judgment came to you. Have you ever had another person accuse you or declare you to be guilty? I mean, like the last time you were pulled over, think back. And some of you, well, maybe you've never been pulled over, but your time will come, right? (laughs) But think about the last time you were pulled over. Remember how that made you feel? And so the officer lights you up, the blue lights, you pull over, maybe perhaps you're in a school zone. He comes to your window and he asks for three things. He wants to see your driver's license, your registration, and proof of insurance. And you're thinking, man, I sure hope I have all these in my glove box. And your, your arm is shaking. Listen, I was a policeman. I remember these days where they, were, they would make every excuse. Well, I don't know where it is, officer. I can't find it. They're all nervous. That's been you. That's been me. We get nervous. And then he says, well, this is why I pulled you over. You're like, yeah, thanks. Remind me why I've been pulled over. It sure doesn't feel good, does it? I mean, it feels like you're a kid sitting in the principal's office. And maybe some of you haven't been in the principal's office. And if you haven't, trust me, it doesn't feel good. You're feeling condemned at this moment. As the officer take goes back to his car, he's going to be doing some things in his car. Hopefully he won't be doing any paperwork. And then so the officer comes back to you and he gives you a warning. At that moment, you feel relief. Whew. I feel relieved. Because you were busted. You were speeding. You deserve that ticket going 40 in a school zone. See, in your mind, it was already written. It was already signed. It was already paid for. You could already see the consequences that were going to come. I mean, your insurance was going to go off the chain. Who knows what else would have happened? But the officer comes back and he says, you know, this is a busy street. And we've had a lot of complaints And there's kids running around here, and you just have to be careful. We don't want a serious situation happen, so slow down. Remember the kids and go your way. In a moment's time, you go from condemnation to relief in just a matter of minutes. You know, I have met Christians over and over and over that live the exact same way. They they go from condemnation to relief, condemnation to relief, and it's back and forth, up and down. It's like they're living on a roller coaster. Listen, you weren't made to live that way. Why? Because there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. You've been released from this vicious cycle. Listen, if you have repented God wants you to know that your sins have been forgiven. Oh, people might be holding them against you, but God isn't. Oh, I know your memory might be bringing them up, but God isn't bringing them up because in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation. See, in Romans, we have read, if you go from chapter one all the way up to chapter chapter eight, we've read that we have all sinned and that there is nothing good that dwells in us in our flesh, that there is none righteous, no, not one, that we are all born into the Adam's family, the first Adam that sent our world into chaos, into pain due to sin. Then in chapter seven, we see that the things we want to do, well, we don't do the things that we want to do. We do the things that we don't want to do, that, you know, the things that, that you hate, And when Paul says this in chapter 7, like I almost hear an anguish because then he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And I just just almost sense the anguish in Paul's life and and just his heart and in his mind. He's like, God, I want to do so well, but I just don't do the things that I want to do. I hate those things that I do. Oh, wretched man that I am. The first seven chapters are heavy. They're very heavy. But chapter 8, verse 1, 
brings relief. That if we are in Christ Jesus, there is no more condemnation. We should find relief in that. That should even excite us. That should, that should help us relax, knowing that our past is not held against us anymore. Also notice in verse 1, there is something special to a very unique group of people. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to who? To those that are in Christ Jesus. I mean, that's a special relationship that's available to every man, woman, and child that will place their faith in Jesus Christ. The person that's in Christ, there is no condemnation. Your past sins are forgiven, washed, and cleansed. Aren't you glad? Listen to what it says in Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I mean, think about this. If we started to travel east and keep going east, do you know that there will never be a time when you're headed west? You'll you'll always be going east as far as the east is from the west. You just keep going and going and going east and you will never end up at a place where you're heading west unless you decide to look back. And so often the source of condemnation is looking backwards and allowing what's in the past to become what's in the present. Listen, this is something that I struggle with. And if I was to ask for a show of hands of everybody here that has struggled with this, probably every one of our hands, well, they should go up because I think this is something that's common to every believer. We struggle with our our past. We struggle with condemnation. We, We struggle with guilt. We just seem to be getting beat up all the time, don't we? It's always coming up in our mind. The Bible says that your sins have been forgiven. Your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins. See, salvation is a whole package. God takes all of you as you are. I mean, I'm so glad that God doesn't come to me and say, you know, Lance, like I was thinking, like I'll take you as you are, but wow, you need to do something with 1995. Like I'll take you, but not 1995. That's not our God. He he says, Lance, I'll, I'll take you in 1995. I'll take you in 1988. I'll take you in 2005 and 2006 and 2007, all the way up to our present day. I'll take you yesterday. I'll take you tomorrow. I'll take you forever by faith in Jesus Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. See, God, he, he, he's outside of time. He doesn't look at time like we do and we have, you know, the past, present, and future. He takes us the whole package and forgives us the whole package today by faith. I mean, we like to think of years and we like to think of months and and we like to think of actions, but the Bible says there's no condemnation. Everything is now to God. So many Christians, so many believers are living under the sense of condemnation to those that are in Christ. To those of you that are in Christ, you still, de- you st- still deal with, with condemnation. And, and if you take notes, I, I, wanna jo- I want you to jot a few things down. I want to give you some signs or some symptoms of the person that lives under condemnation. Now, for some of you, this is going to be confirmation. That it's time to leave that condemning life behind. Uh, but for others, you're going to learn something for the first time this evening like, oh, Wow. Like, that's me. Wow, like, I don't even know, I didn't even know where this is coming from. So these are some of the symptoms. They're certainly not all of the symptoms or all of the signs where condemnation comes from, but if you like to jot them down, here are some signs, some symptoms to look out for in your Christian life. Number one, a person that, that deals constantly with condemnation, you always feel guilty. You always feel guilty whether or not you have done anything wrong. You feel guilty about it. You're always feeling guilty. It might have been conditioned in you by how you were raised or how you were treated in school. That's a sign of living in condemnation, always guilty, even when you haven't done anything. You still feel guilty, condemnation. Number two, 
another sign that condemnation has taken root in your life is that you are motivated by guilt. I mean, guilt just moves you. Guilt does it. I mean, you, you might listen to the announcements and you hear about some great opportunities to serve. And instead of being excited to take out a, a step of faith, thinking, you know, it'd be great to get involved. You have a different attitude. You go, oh no, I'm not doing anything right now. I, I, I better do something. I mean, I, I better get active. Like, I don't think God is happy with me. It's like I got to do something because you feel guilty. Listen, church announcements aren't designed to make you feel guilty. They're just opportunities to step out in faith. And maybe some of you are like, phew, I'm glad. They're just opportunities to step out in, in faith, to put feet to your faith, to start serving the Lord and enjoying his presence. When someone lays a guilt trip on you, you spring into action condemnation number three and don't please don't throw anything at me on this one another sign that you're living under condemnation you're a people pleaser you're a people pleaser you care about what people think about you and that's what moves you i mean when you're doing good you expect people to say so when you're done, when you've done something great, I mean, you want someone to come up and, and thank you and put a, you know, pat your back. And when you don't get it, you, well, you become very upset. Or you're always wanting to be accepted and appreciated. That's what moves you. You serve, you do things because you want people to say, oh man, good job. Like, we couldn't do this without you. Like, you like that. That's, that's what moves you. But when, you, but when the thank yous don't come, when, you, when you're not appreciated, you step out and you serve with this kind of an attitude to please people, you want to be appreciated, and the thank yous don't come, and the pat on the backs don't come, then you start to think, I'm not doing anything for anyone ever again. Well, what does that do? That starts a whole vicious cycle of being beat up and condemned by the enemy because what a nasty attitude that is. People pleasing. You know, I put that in there. That was me. I, I, I admit, I'll be transparent. I struggle with wanting, I want to be a people pleaser. I want to be liked. And I think if we, if we're honest that probably speaks to the majority of us, for a lot of us. We want to be liked. We really care what people think about us. And your whole life is designed to make people think something about you that's not really true. Condemnation. Number four, another sign <clears throat> that condemnation's taken root, you feel like God is mad at you all the time. Oh, God must not like me now. And he's really, he's ready to beat me up here and he's wanting me to do this over here. The mistakes you've made are always plaguing you when you sit down and read your Bible or pray. When you're making a decision to gather together with the saints, you're in a place where, hey, maybe not only do you feel like you're mad at, or God's mad at you, but, but now you're mad at God. And now condemnation is actually turned into pride and it's just devastating. The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. But the enemy, he plays us like a ping pong ball, doesn't he? Back and forth, back and forth, up and down. No fruit from our lives. It's horrible. You feel like God's mad at you all the time. You might even think that God's mad at you. Well, you're mad at God. Everyone is mad at you. Like it's just one big mad session. Condemnation. Number five, you never feel like you've done enough. I mean, you could study and serve and pray for hundreds and hundreds of hours, but all you can remember is the one hour that you didn't. All you think about is what you, you haven't done condemnation I mean you could have attended an all night prayer meeting and not even fall asleep during it and be upset and leave wondering if you should, should have done more condemnation 
Number six, this is really common with condemnation. Here's a sign that you live in condemnation or you're laying a, a condemnation guilt trip on someone else. You're always living in the past. And I'm not talking about the good past. I'm talking, I'm talking about the bad past. It's not all the good things we, we've done together. It's not all good that's been in our life. It's not, it's not about the faithfulness of God. No, what happens in condemnation is that, we, is that all we remember is our failures. And that's how we identify ourselves. We're just one big failure. We failed here. It could, have been, it could be 20 years, and it's just as real today in your mind as it was then because condemnation has taken root in your life. And the bad things of our past has enslaved us. There's a lot more to this list, but these are the common ones. I see this so often among Christians, among believers, in our church, and everywhere I go, it's just like there's this, there's just this sense of condemnation and guilt of Christians dealing with their past. Listen, if you've made mistakes here today and you have sinned, if you're sitting here and you have sinned, by the way, that's all of us. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But if you have repented from that sin and you have been forgiven Wash clean as far as the east is from the west, so far as God removed your sin from you. There is no condemnation. So here's the real question. Are you in Christ? Because it says that if you're in Christ, there's no more condemnation. So the question becomes, are you in Christ? So what does being in Christ mean? Well, that's the person that's been born again. The person that has been born again, I don't just mean like you've been baptized as an infant. I don't just mean that, well, that you've done the rituals that you've been asked to do. I'm not even talking about all the church attendance you might have. Or even the time spent praying or the good deeds that you do in Jesus' name. Listen, have you seriously and decisively asked Jesus to come into your life and to forgive you of your sins? If you have, then you're defined by the Bible as in Christ. Listen, I know we live in the South, and I know, and I know it's a great place to live. It's, it's, it's the greatest place in the United States to live. In my opinion, that's why everybody's moving here. I don't know about what's going on in Knox County, but Sevier County, like we're getting bombarded by people from out of state. It's just crazy. They're, they're fleeing their states. They're coming here. They, it's like they've been on vacation 100 times, and now they want to move to Sevier County or Knox County or Blount County. The people are moving here. Why? Because it's a nice place to live. But, but with that, everybody's a Christian. I remember when I was working for the city of Knoxville, like everybody that I worked with, everybody was, I mean, you would ask probably 100 out of 100 people and everybody knew the Lord. Just ask them. Oh, they would live like the devil the rest of the week, but they knew the Lord. Everyone's a Christian. And so I know that Mark always says this and that in the South, you have to unsave them to resave them, Right? And so we have to ask ourselves. So I ask you, have you seriously and have you decisively asked Jesus to come into your life and to forgive you of your sins? Only you can ask that, answer that. If you have, then you're in Christ. And that's a great place to be. Like, like you don't want to be in a place that's outside of Christ. In Christ you now have a better covenant and better promises. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also a mediator, also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. It's not the oldness of the letter, it's the newness of the spirit. There's a freshness of giving your life to Jesus Christ by faith. You are now related to God by a better covenant that are given by better promises. I mean, don't try, don't let anyone try and take you back to the old covenant, to a legal relationship with God and follow all of these rules and laws and make sure you keep these laws because that's what pleases God. Legalism, being legalistic. Listen, what pleases God is for you to live by faith in Jesus Christ. See, the old covenant had everything to do with what you're doing to be right with God. 
The old covenant always asks, what have you done? What have you done? Do this and live. Don't do this and die. The new covenant is better. It's now the work of God in your life. It doesn't depend on you. I don't know about you, but I'm glad it doesn't depend on me because I'm a knucklehead. It doesn't depend on your hard work. But now Jesus Christ, who's done the work, lives in you. See, to be in Christ means we have accepted his sacrifice as payment for our sin. Our rap sheet contained every sinful thought, attitude, or action that we have ever committed. No amount of self-cleansing can make us pure enough to warrant forgiveness in a relationship with the Holy God. The Bible says that in our natural state, in who we are, man, we're enemies of God. When we accept his sacrifice on our behalf, he switches accounts with us. He exchanges our list of sins for his perfect account that is totally pleasing to God. A divine exchange takes place at the foot of the cross. Our old sin nature for his perfect one. And it's nothing that you've done except for say, God, forgive me. See, the more we learn of our identity in Christ, the more God works in and through you. The more you become a vessel for his honor. The phrase, this phrase, in Christ, well, this is not the first time Paul used it, nor it, will it be the last time. Let's look at a few other places where this exact phrase has been used. Look with me to Romans chapter 3. We will walk through a few places in Romans to see what it is to be in Christ. Because if those in Christ are not condemned. There's no condemnation of those in Christ. We want to know, well, what, what, is, what belongs to us in Christ? Because you don't want to be anywhere else but being in Christ. The Bible says those outside of Christ, those that, that don't have a relationship with God through Jesus, well, the Bible says that there's a judgment upon them, that their sins will be held against them. They will have to give an account for their life that they've lived apart from Jesus Christ. And I realize that there's a good chance, and I know statistically speaking on Wednesday nights, the majority of people who come to church are Christians, but it's not always the case. I'm sure there's people that come to church on Wednesday nights that don't know the Lord, maybe think they do. So I realize that there's a good chance that someone either in this room now or, or possibly watching have never given their life to Jesus that perhaps they have never truly repented and surrendered to Jesus. Or perhaps they is you. See, it's easy to say they or them, but are you in Christ? See, the fingers go from out here to right here. Have you repented? Perhaps you have never responded to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Oh, 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 you might have tried other things. You might have tried a few false religions along the way. You might have tried Christian activities, Christian behaviors, and you even had the Christian language down. But you've never really, ever, truly surrendered your life to Jesus. Oh, you might have been raised in church and have gone to church your entire life. But you may perhaps, maybe you have never truly surrendered. You know, me and my wife were called from Knoxville to move to Haiti for two years. We were full-time missionaries, thought we'd be there for 30 years. You guys that know us know our story. God brought us back two years later. And I tell you, the whole entire two years down there, God did amazing things in Haiti. He, we went down there with six suitcases. We lived with a local Haitian man and his family. We didn't know anybody except for him and his family. And we're like, what are we doing here? Like, what, like what's going on? But during those two years, God was really doing a work. Yeah, he was using us to minister and do those things, but God was doing a work with us. It was a two-year self-examination. Do we, do, do we know the Lord? Do we, are, are we being, is this like, like, I know nobody would like say, yeah, I'm ready to move to Haiti. Like that in itself should tell you, right, that that's God doing it because if H4H, if it was my wanting, I would say H4H should be not house tops for Haiti, but house tops for Hawaii, right? 
So for the fact that we're in Haiti, but, but still we're like, you know what? Man, do we know the Lord? Do we, are we as strong in the Lord as we think we are? It's two years of just self-examination as God was using us. And so I don't think, it doesn't matter how long you've gone to church or what it is. Man, it's good to examine our hearts. It's good to examine ourselves and say, wow, are we, are we in Christ? Because if you are, there's no condemnation. But have you ever truly surrendered and repented? Perhaps you've never cried out from the depths of your heart, God, I admit that I'm a sinner. In need, I need your forgiveness. I accept your forgiveness through the shed blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Listen, if you haven't done that, I would invite you to do that this evening. To lay your life down. The Bible says that there's coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Listen, church, if you bow the knee today, you have heaven to look forward to in a personal relationship with Jesus today. But if you wait until that day where you stand before God at that white, at that judgment of God, and that is the day you, you, you bow, it will be a horrible day. See, we can either bow now and surrender and be saved, or we will be forced to bow later, but it'll be too late. And that's a scary thought, to think about those in our lives that are outside of Christ. Think about those in your life right now that you know they don't know Jesus. And unless they make a decision to be in Christ, judgment awaits. Condemnation awaits. Tragedy awaits. Listen, that should motivate us to share with those that are outside of Christ to become in Christ. Because I don't know about you, but like, I think we're getting close, guys. I really, I, I don't know. We don't know the day or the hour, but I'm telling you, man, things are happening. We're getting close. This is not the time to be lackadaisical. This is not the time to, you know, put your head in the sand. This is the time to get out and share with everybody you know about Jesus. So look with me at Romans chapter three, verse 24 to see what a glorious thing it is to be in Christ. Romans chapter three, verse 24. It says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We've been redeemed. We've been justified. And God has done this work by his grace. Look at chapter six, verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So now you're dead to sin. Not only are you justified and redeemed, but in Christ, sin doesn't have the same effect on you like it did. Oh, I know it might not feel that way at times, but now you have the strength of the spirit to say no to sin. You're dead to sin. Chapter six, verse 23 it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. 85 times you're going to find it in the New Testament. And it's so easy just to, just to read it, read over it, and not think about it. In Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, in Christ, 85 times. But wow, it's a great place to be in Christ Jesus. Like, like I've said it before, but you don't want to be described as in the world. And you don't want to be described as in sin or in rebellion or in resistance or, or in anger or in the flesh. You want to be described as in Christ Jesus. That's a great place to be. Look at chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. It says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, no things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Romans chapter 8 is just so sweet as we see the entirety of it. Romans chapter 8 opens up with no condemnation looking toward our past. No separation and it ends with no separation looking toward our future. And in, everything in between speaks of being in the spirit of God for our present. It's a great chapter of freedom and victory and joy. There's no separation if you're in Christ Jesus. In chapter 12, 
flip over a few pages, chapter 12, we learn that in Christ, we have a new family. Look at verses 4 and 5 of Romans chapter 12. It says, for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. We're a new body. We have a new relationship. We have a new spiritual family in Christ Jesus. And then in 1 Corinthians, we learn that we're sanctified. We're, we're set apart by God for good works, being changed from glory to glory and strength to strength. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, this is a big one. It says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. How many things become new? All things. That's an ongoing work of God's Holy Spirit. That doesn't just speak to the point of salvation in your life where there was this, this turning point. But it also speaks to every other failure that you commit that God is able to redeem you. He's able to forgive you for it. He's able to encourage you, to uplift you. God is for us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? See, we want to be in Christ this evening. If you are, then there's a ton of glorious truths for us that live. So with just a few verses, we see that those in Christ Jesus, well, we're redeemed. We're justified. We are dead to sin. There's no separation. We're sanctified. We have a new spiritual family, and you are a new creation. Listen, this list can continue on and on. It's good to study. I would encourage you to look, go look through the, old, through the New Testament, all the 85 times, you're like, oh man, like that's a big study. Yeah, it is, but it's really good. 85 times where it says in Christ Jesus and look what it says and write it down. It'd be a good study. So this list goes on and on. It's good to study this more in depth. I want to close with this. Will you turn to John chapter 8? John chapter 8. This is where we're going to meet a, a woman who is described as a sinner. She is described as a woman that was caught in adultery. Now, this woman was not only set up, but she was then caught in the very act. And it's one thing to be caught in sin, but it's another thing to be caught in the very act. Hand in the cookie jar. Getting caught sneaking out of the house. Caught in the very act. Pick up with me in verse 3 of John chapter 8. It says, then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. I have in the very act underlined because they wanted to emphasize that. I, I want you to see something. She was in the midst of sin when the Pharisees went in and grabbed her. Watch this. She was rescued by the very same people that set her up. They grabbed her. They took her out of that sin, placed her before Jesus. Now that sin is in the past. She's not currently sinning in front of Jesus. How guilt-ridden she must be. I mean, think about it. I mean, I wish I could just like, like I wish I could just see it. How guilt-ridden she must be now having to deal with the sin that's now in the past. And how heavy it must be to have been caught in such a way, how tears must be streaming from her face, how embarrassed she must be, how ashamed as her past right here in an instant is now haunting her. Her past is pushing her. Her past is condemning her. And there's something and there's nothing that she can do at this moment. But it's in the past. She's dealing with sin in the past in the presence of Jesus. Notice verse 5. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but, but what do you say? 
They said this, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Don't you wish you knew what he, he wrote? I mean, there, we don't know what he wrote. There's a lot of speculation, but I wish I knew what he wrote. Could it be he wrote their names and he wrote the sin down? And then what happens in the next verse? They, they drop their rocks and run, right? They split. We don't know. But Jesus right here is first dealing with the hypocrites. And again, we don't know what he wrote, but there's, there's a lot of speculation. In verse seven, it says, so when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he is without sin among you. Let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. In verse nine, it says, then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. I mean, you want to be found with Jesus after sin. You want to be found in his presence. You want to be found in a place where he can now minister to you or he can bless you or he can forgive you. You want to be in that place where you're not hearing everyone else condemning you. You want to be in the presence of Jesus. But you know what I find too often is when somebody is living a life and they've fallen back into sin, they stay away. They stay away from the Bible studies. They stay away from prayer. They stay away from church. They stay away from their Christian. They isolate themselves. The best place for them to be is to be in the, in the presence of Jesus. Because notice, look at verses 10 and 11. It says, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Like that's forgiveness of Jesus. Like, like that's powerful. See, listen, we all have those that like to condemn. We have those that like to hold our past against us. We have an enemy that likes to condemn. But as we're standing there in the presence of Jesus, he said to this woman and he says to you, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I, I love that because I'm a person that struggled with my past. I was a real knucklehead. I was a real jerk before I came to Jesus. And I hurt a lot of people and I'd done some stupid things and the enemy always uses that, always beats me. And then I come to Romans chapter eight and it says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And that is like, wow, that, that relaxes me. I remember a couple years ago, this is, this is just an ongoing battle I, I've dealt with up until a couple years ago. You know how you like ask for forgiveness for the same sin like over and over and over. You get on your knees like, Lord, please forgive me. Oh, Lord, please forgive me. And, he's, and, I, and I remember a couple years ago, I'm like, God, forgive me. Like, please, God, forgive me. And I, and I was telling him what I did, like he doesn't know. And it's almost like, like I didn't hear him audibly, but man, it, it could have been. I, I felt like it was audibly, it wasn't. But I almost felt the Lord say, Lance, what are you talking about? Like, do you not believe my word? I say that I choose to forget those things. I, I, don't, remember, I, I don't remember those things no more. I cast them as far as the east is from the west. I drop them into the sea of forgetfulness. Lance, do you not believe my word? And listen, from that moment on, I haven't struggled with my past. When it comes up, it says to take every thought captive and just go before the Lord. If you're struggling with your past this evening, if you're feeling condemned, if you're feeling guilt, maybe you've done some things and God's forgiven you, and, or maybe you haven't done anything and yet you still feel guilty, I believe God wants to set you free tonight from your past, from being condemned, from feeling guilty. So just take it before the Lord as we pray, amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for Romans chapter eight. I mean, we thank you for all the chapters in Romans, but Lord, we really thank you for Romans chapter eight, verse one, because we learn that there is no condemnation to us, to those that are in Christ Jesus. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord. And it's not anything that we've done. It's everything that you've done, God. 
I pray, Father, that we would relax tonight, that we would just enjoy you and not re- not be always dwelling with those things, not always feeling condemned and not always feeling guilty, God. I pray, Father, that you would, God, set us free tonight. Help us to walk out of here a little different than when we came, maybe perhaps a little bit, a little bit lighter. God, take the weight, take the burden, God, off. And Lord, I pray, God, that we would lay them at the foot of the cross. Lord, we love you. God, we thank you. And help us to go out rejoicing. In Jesus' name we pray.